When people venture into the world of vegetable growing for the first time, quite often there's a rude awakening. Sometimes it's the weeds, other times it's the pests, but almost always there's a lack of understanding about the systems and strategies required to grow a garden well and do it easily. And unfortunately, without the right strategies in place, gardening can be made really, really difficult. So sadly, a lot of new growers give up on their garden far too early. If you've ever felt like throwing in the towel yourself, then this video is for you. This is the story of a young couple who've committed to reclaiming their food one step at a time. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Matt and Carla of Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. So we are a younger family. We just had a baby. He's eight weeks old tomorrow. So we have three kids now, four-year-old, two-year-old, and a newborn. I'm on maternity leave and Matt farms part-time, well, seasonally, I guess, with my family in the area. And then he does some consulting business work on the side. That's kind of what our life is as a, a snapshot right now. Day in the life is lots of baby stuff and then <laughs> gardening, getting ready for the growing season. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about your backstory? You just have two years of, of gardening experience so far, but you've got a massive garden established already. What, what's been the motivating force in this new development in your lives? I would say it goes way back to probably 2014 approximately. I was in school in Montreal and Matt and I had just gotten married. We moved out there together for me to do school and we were living right downtown Montreal and itching for to be out in the out of the downtown core because we're prairie kids. And so we, we became members of a farm called the Miracle Farm in Quebec and it's run by Stéphane Sobiac. And that was kind of our first experience into the fact that you can actually grow a lot of food on a small amount of land that you can feed yourself and your community with. So he was doing all sorts of cool experiments, working on permaculture and incorporating vegetables, fruit trees, all these different amazing things. We would just go and experience the abundance of his farm. And I remember Matt and I talked and we said, when we, whenever we have enough space of our own, we want to do something like this. We want to figure out how to grow our own food. This is so cool. And so that was probably our first real inspiration, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah. First foray into quality food grown locally. But I think that in terms of the size of our garden, I think that comes back to personality. Carla is a, a go big or go home kind of girl. And so instead of you know, starting with a couple of beds and just taking, you know, one year at a time, it's don't, nope, we're doing the whole thing. Yeah. So yeah. it was. I don't necessarily though succeed my first time because the first summer that we tried to plant a larger scale garden, we didn't have any of the skill set. We just kind of put everything in in rows, like how you kind of traditionally see. We tilled this massive space, seeded it, Weeds grew en masse and I was completely overwhelmed, could not keep up with the weeds at all. It was like crazy. All we did was weed. And so then one day I was, I was in a low moment mowing the lawn and decided to mow the whole garden down. And so I mowed our garden down along with the lawn. And I told Matt, just so you know, we don't have a garden. We're starting fresh <laughs> next <week. laughs> So that was, that was our first year gardening humble years. the humble years yeah and we took some time to actually learn how to garden i spent a lot of time in the library getting out all sorts of books problem with library and youtube is that it's a lot of it's not targeted for my zone or just kind of for our growing style yeah and then i stumbled across a vegetable academy and it was like matt i think i found a resource for us so we, we took the that first course that jared did with kind of the pilot course and it was amazing it was really helpful because at least we got to see somebody in the area that can grow stuff okay. so it was you know it's one thing to see somebody in california or florida grow banana trees it's like <laughs> okay that's great but what do we do here to grow our own food <laughs> after that rather rough start to vegetable growing in year one Matt and Carla joined our Seed to Table community and we worked together to identify the top priorities for them to address. We all wanted to make sure that the next time they started a garden, they could also finish the season with a harvest and leave that lawnmower parked in the shed. I remember we chatted with you during one q and I said, okay, we have to pretty much do everything from scratch. What would, what would you say our priority should be this summer? And you had told us drip line irrigation and weed your area properly. And so those were our two focuses. We invested into an irrigation system we spent many hours weeding out quackgrass specifically, and then we saw 
significantly more success after that. <laughs> it was a good year last year. So we've got a couple of photos here to show people of like a little bit about what you're frustrated about the previous year. Can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here? I'll, I'll speak to this because I was the one doing most of the weeding. <laughs> yes. <I was. laughs> um, yeah, like it was serious weed pressure. Like I would go in there and I would just make it look really clean, clean up all the weeds. And then a week later, the same thing again. And it was like yeah. over and over and over. I didn't even get a chance to really enjoy the garden because all I was doing was weeding. And he told me that we weren't doing a garden anymore if this is what it was going to be like. Yeah, because I, <laughs> I would just go out there and you don't get to enjoy the beauty of it. You don't, you just weed. This is not how it's supposed to be. Yeah. And so coming back to that permaculture idea, the concept is just understanding how nature works and just working within that. So that's kind of been a driving force. I think pain is a really good motivator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad that you had a, a taste of what was possible and that you didn't give up at, at this point because that would have been a really sad ending to the story. And part of the issue too is because we were pretty dedicated to not just resorting to chemical use. There's a lot of conventional farming and stuff like that in this area and we really wanted it to be more of a, like an organic approach. We didn't want to just be spraying everything with glyphosate, that kind of thing. So that was part of the challenge too. <laughs> and, like, and then the sad thing about that's that temporary fix is that it would just be a temporary fix anyways. And then you'd have a bunch of those chemicals in your soil. Anytime you disturb the soil, there'd still be more seeds ready to pop up that you have to spray yeah. again. Yeah. It's not yeah. a long-term solution. Yeah. But on the subject of long-term solution, one of the things that we talked about last spring around this time when in, a, in Q and A's was like how to actually get rid of these perennial weeds for good. So we talked about things like you had access to a skid steer. We talked about whether you could, cover it all and just wait to kill them we talked about like how is it feasible to actually dig it all out how did you make that decision yeah. and what did you end up doing here to control the quackgrass population well i think it was under your recommendation jared i think one of the classes you were talking about quackgrass you said just go in there and pull it and pull it and pull and pull and pull until you have no more and yeah. so in the picture you're showing we hired a whole bunch of young uh, high school kids and we paid them for a day rate and just said, Hey, come in here and we'll pick weeds. I think we had like, like six or six seven years. kids yeah. there and a whole bunch of pitchforks and, you know, shovels and yeah. we just went to work. It was a big day. We had thought about do, like tilling it all once and then so that it could at least loosen it up. The problem was, is that then we didn't want to break up all of the roots. And then just propagate all of specifically our our main issue is quack grass so we didn't want to just accidentally be propagating them yeah. um, and then the we had considered doing a skid steer just going in and removing all of that soil like a, but then the question is if you bring a new soil and it's going to have different weed problems and we wouldn't necessarily know exactly what it was going to have so this was our best option <laughs> especially if we wanted to get a crop off this first year we didn't want to tarp everything and then wait for a whole season yeah we just wanted to start growing okay yeah, good, good idea on hiring the students. I was assuming these were, this was, these were your family members, but maybe you can maintain better relationships with your family members yeah. if you hire out. <laughs> That's kind of weird. We had some kind family members joining yeah. that we fed very well that day. But oh, it I'm was sure. hard. Yeah. And just to give you an idea of the kind of roots they were pulling out, this is a great photo from Carla here of just like a five foot long quackgrass root and rhizome ensemble there. Yeah. Was this pretty common that you were able to, they must've been very well established for you to have to, or be able to dig out this much. Yeah. Well, we had a contest that day. We said, whoever gets the longest quack grass gets 10 bucks. <laughs> so they were motivated. Yeah. They were and motivated. we tried to make it a fun contest. So whoever had the longest route, we would like, you know, display it draped over something. And then when somebody found the next one, you'd put, you'd display it. We tried to make weeding fun Good. and they but bought it. I think this is a good picture. So viewers take note. This is what you're up against if you have quack grass issues. Yeah. The enemy is real. Yeah. And it's also yeah. like this should be in a textbook of quack grass because this is what you need to do to get rid of it. If you're like so many people will just rip it out at the top and think, oh, I got rid of the grass for now. But lo yeah. and behold, underneath a couple inches is just all those rhizomes are ready to sprout again at every single yeah. node. So this is and what you what need to do. Saying. Prior to this, yeah, Matt yeah. would go through the stirrup and be like, I got all the grass. And then a week later, it would be 
back with friends. So yeah, this is this is effective. Yeah. The great thing about Quack Cross is that once you you've been through this process and you're if you do it thoroughly, then it's gone. You just have to maintain your edges yeah. then. So you're kind of home free. Yeah. After that point, you got into some more enjoyable stuff as, and that involves staking these beds out. So can you tell us a little bit about how you, like the order of things for how you manage the soil as you started to shape the beds and you do things like add compost and, and then get into planting? Well, you know, it, like you see in that picture, you know, started with digging some, some trenches and, you know, it, it was a good opportunity for us to do another quick weed, but also add some compost. So we wanted to do a test. So we use two different types of compost. There's a, a gal in Prince Albert that has a, a compost business. And so we brought in a, 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 quite a bit of compost. And then we have friends that have a cattle operation. So we got some manure. And it was actually a really good test because um, it was a good, actually a good lesson to learn that, you know, that manure needed to be, it, it wasn't fully weed free it provided some moisture retention in the soil because it was you know we can layer. lots of organic matter yeah there. lots of organic matter but with it came lots of weed seeds so uh, fortunately we introduced kind of a new flush of different weeds into the <laughs> garden wherever uh, we used to wherever we used friends. it yeah so okay. we have patches where you'll see uh, you know these new weeds popping up and it's like okay that's where it's you learned another that. lesson yeah. yeah, it's never cheap out of compost. <laughs> Good to know. So yeah, after we did the trenches and kind of we just made the beds roughly where we knew we would go, we wanted them. And then the next thing was we we brought in a bunch of wood chips. There's a lot of trees and forest up here and quite a few, I guess, like mill places. So we got one of yep. them, we got wood chips from, and we filled all of the, I guess, little ditches where we brought soil on top of our beds with mulch just for water retention and weed suppression and and walking paths mm -hmm. and we found that what was probably our one of the best things we did this summer or last summer because it was so dry up here it was it was quite a drought and it was very hot and we were very impressed with the weed suppression as well as just how even the moisture was throughout the garden all summer long mm -hmm. with those rows it would be baking out and no rain whatsoever. And, uh, you know, anytime you put your, your hand underneath the mulch areas, it was still moist. So that was pretty neat to see. Here's just a quick clip so you can get an, a sense of how the mulch looks at home there. Check out what Matt finished this morning while I was working on legal stuff. 22 rows. <laughs> we have planted in five of them so far. And then we have our perennials behind there. Just got to get wood chips to fill the rows much better, deeper, and a bit more compost. We'll get into the stuff that happened in between, but here's like a look at the amazing garden that came as a result of all this preparation work. Just light years ahead of that, that garden that you were mowing the previous year. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you've had time to just kind of sit back and, and appreciate the, how far you've come because in gardening, you always get focused on the th things that you could do next. Like, oh, next year I want to do this and this could be better. And it, there were still some weeds, but thinking back, it's important to still recognize what you've accomplished too. So yeah, yeah definitely. thank you. Next, we'll talk about a little bit of the gear that you've added to your systems this year, the trellising and irrigation. So start us off with the trellising changes that you made. I've got a bit of an old and new picture here. What did you mm. try in the past year? And then what did you change to this year and how did it go well i think with our first like the old trellising we carla was inspired by some you know, i don't know if it was pinterest or instagram <laughs> yeah. and they look so pretty you know these massive arches and this so i you know i constructed quite a few of these trellises and they they, were they looked really neat and they did not work at all like they, they were so impractical and so we needed to go back to the drawing board because the other thing about the trellising is because you got to do rotation, you got to move all that. So it was like, oh, I got to take it down. And so yeah, it it's hard to mend the, the soil butt. underneath when you have like permanent trellises. And yeah. they, 
they do look really lovely when they work. Like this one that the kids are pulling down was like a bean tent the year before. And that was cool while it lasted, but then you have to pull everything off and, you know, clean it all up and pull. Yeah. It's just a lot more work. So when we were doing the course and we realized how simple the trellis system was, we were like, we are definitely trying that for the tomatoes. That was our first one because tomatoes are one of our favorite things to grow and we have not been very successful at trellising them. So we thought we would just try some of those more simple and very mobile movable trellises. A little bit of an investment, but definitely worth it because it was leaps and bounds easier to work with. And Yeah, I would highly recommend it. <laughs> I mean, that, like Carla said, there's, there is an investment aspect to it, but the time it takes to set up and take down way less. Plus, it's just a really solid way of trellising. You know, like you, you, we found our plants or our tomato trees just went, crazy and it also really helped with pruning yeah in the years prior we really didn't understand pruning but doing your course there really helped us understand oh hey we can prune as we go and having the exposure through the trellising this way was really easy to access yeah and if you want to have multiple leaders on your tomato vine then just add an extra string and then you just follow that string right up to the top yeah Exactly. Yeah, it's just, it was here. very simple. I was very intimidated by trellising initially, but now it just is, it's possible. And then also harvesting was made really quite easy because it's, once again, the exposure, it's just really simple. Yeah. Now, it, our, instead of our indeterminate tomatoes being our least favorite, they're our favorite. <laughs> oh, nice. they're so easy. <laughs> yeah. And tell us a little bit about your irrigation setup. This was, this was a really good investment for us, especially because we had such a dry year last year. We, we also went away in August. And so mm -hmm. we set up the system to have an automatic timer built in. So that was, that was honestly a game changer for us because we could be away and not have to worry about, Hey, is the garden going to be, you know, burnt. And cause when we got back, our grass was toast. But in our in our beds, it was moist. Like it was, I was very impressed with the setup. Mm -hmm. And you're gone for 15 days, did you say? Like that's a huge span. Yeah, we, it's awesome. Yeah, it was too long. For it us. was too long. We realized we won't do that again. Okay. But when we got back, the the soil was really moist. We had no issues. Only good things to say about it. Now that Matt and Carla have made some of these upfront investments, they've flipped the script from their first year of gardening and, like us, are starting to enjoy some of the benefits of producing their own food for their growing family. I made a shark! This is a picture of our oldest, Pascal. She was three last year and her she just started lighting up when she realized that all this food would come from the garden. She loved coming in and, um, you know, ex exploring with us, picking. We'd give her a basket, tell her to go find certain things, and she'd get to go on, like, you know, a little treasure hunt. Yeah. Um, both her and our second at that point loved the raspberry strawberry patch, ate us clean all <laughs> of our first year strawberries and raspberries. It's just so neat <laughs> to have her think that this is normal and this is where you grow up, get to eat out of a lot of the summer. And so hopefully... This all just becomes naturally learned and she doesn't have to start learning from scratch when she's our age. She can just, this is a natural part of her life. It was neat too, because if you tell her, hey, we're gonna eat the beet that we picked this afternoon, she's way more excited to try something. And when they help harvest it, to wash it, prepare it, all that kind of stuff, they're involved in the process. Because mm -hmm. so there's a, no disconnect between where the food is grown to how it gets to the plate, which I think is really, uh, bit of a travesty yeah. when you think of the food system you know people just think oh food comes from a grocery store well no <laughs> we even have like like adult friends have the have the same kind of light bulb experiences when they come to our place now in the summer which is so fun to be part of just for them to see what it looks like being grown and then helping us harvest and preparing or eating with us they just they're excited and inspired to grow their own food which is the whole point exactly That's what we're hoping Yes, that we is that's to get exactly what I want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> now yeah. you're role models in your own circle of friends and, and that's the way we transfer these values on to a bigger culture by those, yeah. every, like, every one of those little relationships impacts people slowly and bit by bit, we oh, yeah. build a culture that can grow their food again. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the only protest that we've had from our kids about vegetables is when we 
we cook them too much. They they're just all raw, all for like they'll eat raw cabbage, but they they don't like it as much if we cook. They don't them. like it cooked. Oh, that's funny. We'll work on it. So what's next for Matt and Carla? Well, obviously they haven't checked off everything from their wish list in year one, but now that they've learned how to produce a significant amount of food with much less labor, they get to move on to the next challenges like setting up food storage systems and fine tuning their planning to better match their production with their family's needs. So storages are probably our largest pain at the moment because we are not properly set up for the quantity of harvest that we brought in. Like we had 200 and some pounds of carrots. Yeah, it was a, it was a great Massive. amount of carrots. Massive. We were really excited. We had planned to store everything in our garage and kind of along some stairs into our house. That usually is quite cool. But then we had an abnormally warm fall, that which was lovely for being outside. But since it was hot during the autumn, we actually lost a lot of our carrot harvest and some uh, of our potatoes and beets turned out. So, so yeah, back to the drawing board for that. We have to get a more temperature controlled space and um but it's a good lesson to learn to, you know from start to finish you can't really cheap out or you can't cut any corners because you can do all that work all those hours of weeding and you know seeding and all that stuff just to you know have at the end no place to store it properly yeah so that's yeah. a one priority for us this summer, this spring it's, it's nice to hear you say that some of the things that I have advised people in the course, like invest in cooling because you want to preserve the value of your crop. So I'm, I'm glad that you just happened to say that because it is a really good point of advice and you don't really, you don't necessarily see how important that is until you've lost some of your prized vegetables. And then all of a sudden storage is number one. We have to save the value of all this. Yeah. Then. And it, yeah. And if you have, you know, smaller crops, you know, 10 pounds of carrots, well, throw them in the, in the fridge. So it's, it's possible to do that, but if you're going to be bringing in, you know, a harvest, you got to be prepared for that. So yeah. that was a lesson in, learned. In the past, we never had large scale crops like this, that we'd like bring in that we were trying to feed our families through the winter with. So yeah. It, yeah. So you got two options. <laughs> you can either figure out storage or heating, give it all away. Or give it away. <laughs> <laughs> Did you note any kind of breaking points for yourself as a family this summer between the point when you were planting the garden and the final harvest periods? We actually felt found we were overwhelmed with the harvest, especially for the pantry garden. You harvest everything at the end of the season in a smaller window, or at least yeah. we're not very good at our harvests, so they're spread out yet. That's yeah. something that we need to get better at. Doing some succession planning yeah. I think will be important and just understanding how long certain crops take to come up and that you can actually harvest and eat them as you go. I think that we had this idea that, you know, with carrots, for example, that I need to just wait until they're all, you know, at a perfect six to eight inch length. And then we pick them all. Well, just eat as you go, you know, yeah. just if they're small, who cares? Enjoy them. Yeah. yeah. We found it's, it is difficult to balance with having a family. So, we have just termed that we kind of were kind of in like a happy chaos stage. We really try to bring our kids in as much as we can to join us. Sometimes, you know, you have them helping you do seeding and then all of a sudden a whole bag of seeds is on the ground and you're trying to pick it up or, you know, you like, for example, this year, there are certain things that I started a month later than I was hoping to, because we had a new baby and then we ended up having a bunch of sickness go through our house and it's like, well, you do what you can. We just learn and we're just trying to figure out how we can just be doing a little bit of work all the time rather than like mass amounts of work in concentrated periods of time because I think it will be a lot more manageable as we get better at that. Yeah, yeah that's a really great mindset to have. Even if you anticipated that a task would be needed to be done in two weeks from now, if you have the time today, go out to the garden or do something related to the garden while well, you have the time and, and get a head start on it so that you can spread that work out over. And once you get into yeah. more succession planting and and spreading out your harvest throughout more of the season, the beauty of that that planning that work that you do is that you do end up spreading out the work more. So you're not doing this huge push in spring to transplant everything kind of around the same time. And you're not doing this huge harvest push in fall. You're, you're spreading out the work too. So that does help with balancing the peak yeah. loads as well. 
I wasn't asking yeah. that question to remind you of, of those challenges, but just to like <laughs> to help you be relatable. Like everyone has those breaking points. I'm just yeah. curious what it was for you. Yeah. It's real life. <laughs> we yeah. have, and learning as we go, right? So that's one thing we're looking forward to implementing this year is is just more um, successions. Because when I look at what you're doing, you know, and how you explain it, you, you have harvests. I mean, you're harvesting things already at the end of June, you know, like that's, and then throughout the, throughout the whole summer. And so we're excited to start mm -hmm. learning how to do that more effectively. And I, and I think, I guess, it's also important to not try to do everything and to just understand that, hey, you know, pick three things that you want to focus on this year. Don't try to have, you know, all your ducks in a row because it's not going to happen. You're going to get burnt out. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, just have a couple of things, the main things. And then yeah, we can learn, build on them. And then the next year, you know, you build upon that. But just, you know, at least enjoy the garden. You know, be out there and don't don't just think about it like work. Because that's the first couple of years. That's what Matt hated it because he just thought it was a chore. And now his whole mindset has changed because <laughs> he's enjoying good food out of it yeah. and more manageable weeding. Yeah. And we're not having water, like hand watering and that kind of stuff. So we're taking a lot of the labor hours out of it. Exactly. Um, yeah. by, by setting up, you know, the, the processes that you taught in your course. And now we're just building upon that. We're hoping that we're getting, we'll get more efficient every year and give us another three years. And hopefully it'll just kind of be like second nature. And we'll be able to just plan out a summer, you know, and plan out our winter eating schedule. I was like, so inspired in January when you showed us how you measured all of your family's food in January oh, right. by weight, percentage that you were still eating from the garden. And it was just like, we were definitely not eating that percentage in our house. <laughs> so, but I was just like, Matt, this is exactly our goal and it's possible. It's so nice to see that it's possible. So we're hoping that we can kind of be a few steps ahead of people who are just starting where we were a few years ago and we can, you know, show them that it's possible what they want to do next. And we've learned that way more is possible than we thought was possible before we started down this path with the Vegetable Academy. Yeah, and you made some great points there about not trying to do it all in the first year. And I think you made some really good decisions with what you did invest your time in this year, like tackling the weeds and automating your irrigation. Those are two huge areas that not only make your plants grow better, but they save you time. So then you start to think, oh, this is this is manageable now. I'm not, or Matt's not out there every day weeding anymore. And I don't have to turn this timer on all the time or or like hand water they made some good decisions well, we have, there. We have, we have you to think they're, they're, yeah, thank you like for I, the tips it's not like i looked it up in some book you know <laughs> we just tuned in it really comes back to you know getting connected with with guys like you jared who have so much passion so much experience that you're really fast tracking us it's amazing to see the transformation that can happen in just one growing season especially when you're guided by an experienced teacher and you start to employ the right strategies. If you've ever felt like giving up on your vegetable garden, know that there are solutions out there and you're capable of a transformation like this too. When you're ready to get to work, you can start with my free mini course. There's a link in the description below. And if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button to let me know you'd like to see more stories like this in the future. I'll see you in the next one.